Hi, welcome back. Yet another um, amazingly special session to come. Um, I just wanted, we're gonna do very brief introductions um, and move into some uh, uh, scene work and then widen it into discussion. But I wanna, um, it's a particularly special combination of people, one of whom many of you know well, who's my uh, close colleague since the moment I got to Georgetown, uh, was here a year before. Uh, I was as part of opening this building and shaping the theater and performance studies program here. Um, uh, Professor Maya Roth, who um, is, uh, specializes in uh, feminist plays and cross-cultural adaptation and new work development, has worked closely with Heather Raffo over many years uh, with our own faculty member, Christine Evans. She stewards the uh, uh, Jane Chambers Prize, a uh, really important prize in our field of which uh, our guest today is, uh, is a, re a recipient, as is Christine Evans um, and others, and she has a new co-edited volume, Lesbian and Queer Plays from the Jane Chamber Prize, and a second one coming, Cross-Cultural Plays. So she is going to be uh, the perfect person, of course, to be in conversation with the incredible um, Martina Mayock, who I was the recipient um, of the Pulitzer Prize uh, for Cost of Living in 2018. Um, also the writer you know, of uh, a number of other extraordinary plays, largely about the immigrant experience, the play Queens, um, and the play Ironbound, which was done here in DC in a memorable production at Roundhouse Theater. Um, and the play we'll be engaging with today is her play Sanctuary City, which is in development for a production at New York Theater Workshop next season. So I'm gonna invite, uh, I think, first Maya to the stage to just briefly set up the Sanctuary City scene, and then we'll move forward with Maya and Martina. So please welcome Maya Roth. Um, so, screening and loving. In 2003, a recently naturalized teenager pants the narrator and documented best friend in order for him to stay in the country, sharing doubts and desires um, that threaten their lifelong relationship. So that's the kind of blurb that you'll hear. Um, it's an extraordinarily exciting play, um, and Martina is currently working on six or seven uh, different pieces. Seven. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, this one I think had a reading um, in this past year at New York Theater Workshop, and then it's going to come in next year. Um, and now I'm going to switch over to whoever the stage gives me. Sanctuary City by Martina Mayock. Age, age 17 to 21. B, age 17 to 21. Special character Henry, 25. Place, Newark and Mirabelle, in the years 2001 to 2006. A bare stage and then a surprise. For this reading, when you hear, it's a new memory. Climb up the fire escape. I see that. Can I come in? What time is me? You know I have a test Can you tomorrow. Let me in? First Quick, period. Someone calls the and cops. No one's gonna no one ever calls the Focus, cops. Come downstairs and oh, let me hold in. on. It's freezing. Hold on. It's freezing. Hold. I don't want to wake your mom. It's buzzing. freezing. So I climbed up the Wait, where's your coat? I know it's place. Where's your coat? It's freezing. Oh fuck, it's freezing. I know. What happened? Can you close the window? 
She's going back. What? But she's going back. Who? Back. Well, hold on, the manager's looking at me. I don't know what to do. Meet me outside. I don't know what to do. What happened? Can't wait to get away from all. Your neck. One day I'll. Oh, did you see your neck? It's at home. What? My coat. Didn't have a chance to grab it. Can you close the window? Oh, my arm. Yeah. Never wanted to hurt someone so fucking bad for him to hurt. So fucking first opportunity I get, man, I'm out of there. Wait, is your mom okay? Can I get under your blanket real quick? Yeah. It's cold. Better? Yeah. Good. Can I crash with you tonight? What happened? She's going back. Who? Back home, my mom. Back? She's going back. She's, she's afraid of staying in the country. There's, there's some shit at work, she said. Boss keeps taking money from her tips because, you know, he can. What she's going to do, report it? To who? And she's afraid what happened to Jorge is going to happen to her, and so she's going back. And because of September. Keep your voice. You like, think I'm in the now bathroom. anything can happen. Anything can happen to her now. Like, she didn't say that, but so she's going back. What about you? Well, she said I have to decide. Decide what? If I want to stay what? or go back, yeah. Did she give you a date? Like, now. She like to know now, like right now, soon, real soon. I'm 17, she says, about almost grown, she says. So she says, I can just decide what I want to do. She didn't want to wait till you finish school? No. But it's just one more year. No. Your senior year. No, she doesn't want to wait. I've been here 10 years. 10 years we've been, that's half my life, more than half my life. I got everything here. Yeah, like, yeah, my family's there, but everything from over half my life, that's all here. Why would she just go? I don't know what to do. Without you. She came here for you. Why would she be going back without you? Did something happen? I don't know what to do. I got blood on your cheek. Oh. From my arm. I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's fine. I'll say it's mine. Then what are you going to do about next year? Can you graduate? Well, if I stay. What about college? I can't go. Why? Unless I pay for it myself, which <laughs> I can't go. Well, what are you going to say at school tomorrow about your arm, your neck? I'm not going. Yeah. Yeah, probably you should maybe don't. What are you going to say at school about your face? I'm not going. Yeah. Yeah, probably you should maybe don't. What are you going to say at school about your eye? I'm not going. What are you going to say at school about I'm the... I'm not going. Yeah. Yeah, probably should maybe don't. Last time this shit happened, remember my eye? Mr. Romano saw, sent me to the nurse. Nurse called my mom. Mom said I fell. Then she freaked the fuck out on me when I came home. She said to say I fucking fell. Whatever. Said to say I always fall. I fell, which I think they'll buy once. I can bring you the homework. Say I'm sick. The flu? I can bring you the homework. Say I'm sick. Yeah, the flu. You flew last time. A cold? Yeah, just say a cold. Yeah. I'll bring you the homework. Say I'm sick. A cold. Something longer. Right. Need a few days this time. Chicken pox? Yeah, say chicken pox. <laughs> I can bring you the homework. Say I'm sick. Chicken pox. Use that already. Right. Measles? Mm. Mumps. Fox mumps. Stomach bug. No. Why? No, that's nasty. No. Ooh. Lice. No. Crabs. A cold. Yeah, I think it's fine to use a cold again. A cold. A bad one. A really bad Don't cold. Say lice. <laughs> I can bring you the homework. Say I'm sick. The flu. Are you sure you just don't no. want to tell? She's scared they'll send us back if they find out what's going on at home. Who? Or just her. She's scared they'd separate us. Who would send you back? America. They wanted to investigate if they like check. She's using a fake social security for years. Everyone's more, you know. Yeah. Because of mm -hmm. September. Or maybe they put me in some kind of some place for kids, separate us. I don't know if she even knows specifically what to be afraid of, but she is. She's scared. There's that place on Fishkill Road in South Kearney, the, the place where Haley's dad got sent to. Oh, that's just for guys, that place, I think. No, I don't want to get separated. I prefer to go to Fishkill Road. Well, it's just for guys. But where do they send women? They got to have somewhere to put the women. Where do the women go? I don't know. Further, I guess. I don't want to get separated. I don't want anything like Fishkill. I know there's people, even if it's just for guys, I know there's people there on Fishkill Road behind wire. I see them. We drive by and I see. There's barbed wire and people, and I don't want to go. Well, you wouldn't have to go. That place is real. It's just better not to talk about anything that happens at home. Better I say I fell or have the flu. Well, maybe it would be good to be separated. Not from my mom. Well, no, but... She's never going to leave him. 
You think I haven't asked? I asked. You want me to hide under your bed from your mom? It's okay. I can just do it right now before she wakes up if you need me out. No, it's okay. My mom won't care. I'll just walk around the neighborhood, go to Paolo's whenever they open, hang out there, eat some eggs. I didn't finish math anyway. You can just stay here. I've been coming by a lot. Well, so stay. Eat breakfast with us. Do we eat breakfast? Not usually, but I could. Yeah. We could. Together. Yeah. I got eggs. Stay. Don't go. Oh, then I end up just like her. If I stay in the country, I'd just be like my mom, doing whatever job, a shitty job, whatever shitty job would take her just to fuck her over down the you line. Went to school. Now, always scared. You did like all of school it here. It doesn't matter. My mom brought me over and she kept me over. So? So when she overstayed her visa, so did I. You were a kid. We were supposed to go back nine years ago. And you were supposed to know that? You were supposed to buy a plane ticket at fucking eight? It doesn't matter. You were a kid. It doesn't matter. If they find out how long we've been here, we won't even be allowed back for another 10 fucking years. Don't go. Your mom's gonna think we're sleeping together. We are sleeping together. <laughs> I mean, like, together. I don't think so. Why the fuck not? Which, <laughs> I can't go. But why? Because I can't pay for that. For college? By myself? Neither can I, but aid. I can't apply for aid. Why? Because I'm not supposed to be here. Okay, wow. Because I never scream at you when you ask we me We came questions. here legal, but we didn't <laughs> stay here legal. We overstayed. So I'm a fucking criminal according to here. I could pay for school if I could pay for school. They'd like take my money. Or if I had, like happily. Listen, I could do a lot of things if I had money. I can't get aid. Scholarships. Can't apply for financial aid. Can't go. Your mom can help? My mom is leaving. What about community college? No. But you could uh, No, still... fuck that. You know how fucking hard I work since coming here? Fuck that. I get better grades than fucking everyone in there. I work harder than... Mm, fuck that. Good night. Good night. Hey. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. <gasps> For real, though. Thank you for letting me stay. It's okay. Good night. Hey. Yeah. Thanks. All good. Good night. Hey. Yeah. Thank you. Anytime. Good night. We'll find a way for you to stay. There isn't one. We'll make Th one. I don't even know if I can even... My mother's working a full-time job for this roof, and she has to borrow money from me sometimes. Coming home like half a person after work, exhausted. How am I going to do all that and school? How am I going to do that? You can live with me and mine. You don't even want to live at yours. <laughs> Good night. Hey. Yeah. Thanks. It's okay. Thank you. It's okay. Thank you. It's okay. I owe you. Thank you. Buenas noches. Shabbate. Good, Good night. I can help you pay rent. What? On this apartment. I'm over here all the time. We sort of kind of already live together here. Sleep to I, I sleep here sometimes, so I should help. I can pay. For a year, then you're gone. First opportunity you get, man. You just finished school, at least. Well, then, then what? They'll keep working at the restaurant? Mopping floors, washing dishes, or, or shit, I could always go to war. They're not checking papers. Could just ship out with all the seniors still failing algebra. Be like a high school reunion in Iraq. We'll find a way for you to stay. She left. What? She's gone. We're leaving. What? She's gonna leave him, we're leaving. And how are you gonna help me pay rent? With my job. And how much you make? 100 a week? Varies. Can't bank on varies. It varies, but I'm there almost every day after school except Thursdays. Shit, I've come away with a hundred sometimes just on Fridays because of tip out. Really? Almost once, yeah, almost. <laughs> if things keep going how they're going at home, I'll be at your place a lot. Really? Unless you don't want me to. Oh, no, you're good. It doesn't look like anything's gonna change, so I'll probably be here a lot if you'll like have me. I'll make a key. So I'll contribute. 
That way you won't have to do this completely alone and you can finish school. You're sure? Make me a tea. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I can and do you this. You can rent out the extra room. What room? For extra money, you can rent out the extra room in this apartment. When she eventually... I'm sorry. You're leaving? My mom and I... Wait, where? Harrison, like, like right on the border, close. How did, how did she... She got naturalized. What? She's a citizen now. She was taking all the tests secret. She got a naturalization certificate, a restraining order, and a fucking moving company, all secret. We're, we're gonna, when he leaves for work, we're gonna pack up all our shit and go. When? Tomorrow morning, today. Today, in a few hours, today. Moving guys are coming soon as he's gone. Then we gotta pack up everything we can and haul that shit out fast. We gotta be out there by four when he's back from work. Back to an empty fucking apartment. She had this shit planned for months, fucking months. I can't believe it, we're finally leaving and I don't even have to switch schools. That's great. I know. Uh, congratulations uh, to we're your mom. Bo we're both moving. Uh, on becoming a citizen. Oh, I'm one too. What? She squeaked in right under the deadline. What do you? Like right under the wire, because if you're under 18, if the kid's under 18, when the parents get it, then it gets transferred to the kid automatic. W so you didn't have to pay none of the, those fees? Or, Guess not. Or have to take the test? Nope. I'm sorry. Uh, you're gonna need help um, with packing? We got guys. I know, but do you need more help? I mean, you gotta pack up an entire apartment in how long? Yeah, but it's during school. So how are you gonna? My mom's gonna call and say I'm sick. She planned that shit too. So I'll say I'm sick. No, but you have to miss school. I didn't do the math anyway. Okay. Okay, tomorrow then. Uh, you wanna crash here? Tonight? One last time? Why one last time? I'll make eggs. And you can rent out the extra room. What? For extra money, you can rent out the extra room in this apartment. When she eventually. Sorry. It's okay. When? This morning. Did she say goodbye to you? I rode the, the train with her to the airport. Helped her carry her stuff. Well, they don't let you wait anymore. Did you know that? They don't let you wait with your person that's gonna board the plane because of September. So if you're not gonna get on the plane, they don't let you pass security. And I watched it out the window. Watched for hours. Imagined her in one of them. Knew she was in one of them. Flying away. Fucking, of course we said goodbye. I'm so sorry. We've been saying goodbye since she bought the fucking ticket. You wanna crash? Tonight? <clears throat> With me? At mines? I don't wanna go back there by myself. Yeah, I, I, I know can. you got your new place now. I I'd love to crash. And she left a, a, a glass of water on the table. She drank out of it this morning and left it on the table. It'll still be there. It's gonna be parts of her all over the apartment. Things she left, clothes she, she wants me to donate. I don't think I can. It's okay. Thanks. It's okay. Oh, there's so much to pack. There is so much to pack. I mean, you could just leave him a mess, right? If there's shit you don't want. True. Shit you don't want to clean. Yeah. Well, you're never coming back, so leave that fuck a mess. I thought about pissing in his bed. Why don't you? We'll see how we're doing on time. Would you want any of them? What? The clothes. Let's start with the clothes. Clothes. I can do that if you want a box of books. Books. I don't know how I could have done this shit alone, even with the guy. Hey, tape? Yeah, I don't know how you could have either. Those guys are garbage. Get your money back. I'm gonna miss this place. Well, how could you miss this place? 12 years. Yeah, but... Longer living here than anywhere else. Then longer than I know you even. But well, still. It's the place I was. I'm from here. Even though I was born and I'm from here. Wherever I end up ending up, I'll have gotten there from this place, here. And it's closer to you than my new place is gonna be. You don't have to if you... No, just, you sure you don't wanna keep this? Well, if you like it, 
Take it. You sure? Take it. Thank you. But don't throw it away, okay? If you take it, don't just throw it out. Okay. Wear it, like, sometimes. There's another one. What, another what? We just moved, and there's already another one, like, like a weed. Like a, at least he doesn't knock her unconscious yet, that I know of. Yeah, just, I, I don't know, man. I can't seem to keep a dick out of that woman. Uh, that woman gave you life. So did yours, and here we are. Can I crash? You still can't sleep? Don't you have a test tomorrow? Or it's late. There's so much stuff. Should have the life of stuff. We don't have to do this all right now. Come to bed. Would you want any of them? What? Her clothes. You don't have no, to. No, just, you sure you don't want to keep this? Well, if you like it, take it. You sure? Take it. Thank you. But, but don't throw it away, okay? If you take it, don't just throw it out. Okay. Wear it. Sometimes? Come to bed. Good night. Hey. Yeah? Thanks. It's okay. Thank you. It's okay. Thank you. I owe you. It's okay. No fucking way. Come on. It's racist. No, I'm telling you it's okay. This is so fucked up. So you'll do it? No. Come on. I can just write a note. I can forge a note. Just be glad they don't want her to come in. I'm calling. No. It's ringing. I'm not ready. You've heard her talk enough times. This is so racist. You've had like nine years of research. This is so... It's ringing. This is so... Hello? Yes, hello. Uh, good morning also to you. <laughs> yes. Yes, hello, yes. My son. Oh, my God. Is sick? The flu? No, sorry, lice. He is disgusting, yes, and cannot be in school. Tell everyone, thank you, bye. What'd they feed you tonight? Chicken milanese. Nice. I brought some. What? What'd they feed you tonight? Penne vodka sauce. Yes. What'd they feed you? Penne vodka sauce. Yes. With chicken. Yes. Fuck yes. What'd you get tonight? Spaghetti. Oh, okay. What'd you get tonight? Chicken. Yes. What'd they give you? What'd you get tonight? Actually, so they want us to eat family meal at work now, actually. Oh. Because people, yeah, because people take too much. Sure. Bring it home for their actual families. Right. You eat? Yeah. What's that? Chicken milk. Yes. <laughs> What'd they give you tonight? Oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot to grab food. Well, you didn't eat? I forgot. Oh. Okay. You hungry? There might be something in the fridge. Not much. You want me to run to the Why store? Why don't you check? Well, shop right. Why don't you just check open the fridge? Still. Check the fridge. This is the only time you see a physical object in this entire section. The light blurs the scene. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy. I'm sorry. I meant it as a nice thing. I know. I'm sorry. Where have you been? A scream? Out. Okay. Where have you been? Good night. Out. Good night. Where have you been? Where have you been? Okay. Okay. Where have you been? Can I get under your blanket real quick? Yeah. It's cold. Better? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Oh. Jesus Christ. Can you open the, the window? The fuck? Hello? Are you fucking kidding me right now? What? I can't hear you. I'm coming. You gonna open the I'm window? I'm coming and I'm opening it now! You mad? I'm exhausted. These fucking essays, fucking homework. I'm just not, I'm not doing this fucking math homework. Fuck math. Fuck all math. They called me in the work tonight, and what could I say? Now it's 2 a.m., I'm so tired, I don't even... Why don't you just take the fucking stairs? Tradition. <laughs> you have a key. I left it. Can, can I crash? I'm not doing well, you know? 
You're sick? No, I'm not. What's wrong? I'm telling you, I'm not doing well in school. I, I'm not doing well with any of it. Work, I can't keep up. I, I'm so tired. I'm so like, it's like I'm running in my sleep everywhere, all the time, running. Just use the key, please, next time. I just got into school. What? I got in. W where? Boston. Scholarship? What's that? A bottle. The rest of a bottle to celebrate. You can copy my math. so much to say, and I think probably the, the most important thing to do right now is to respond to the piece that just happened. Um, so, uh, Martina, can you tell us just a window about what sparked this project? Um, sorry, also I lost my voice yesterday, so this is what you got, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, like this, this and, uh, most of my other plays, I started from a personal place. I was actually working on another play, um, and um, l couldn't. S I, I was sleeping about three hours that uh, for like a week working on that play. I went to bed at three in the morning, and I kept thinking about something from a memory of mine. And um, I got up at three in the morning to think that maybe th maybe this is a play. Um, I started taking notes, and I just realized I was writing the play. So then I had basically the first act by like. 10 in the morning <laughs> and uh, wrote it in three days uh, in a kind of a fever pitch and, and sort of uh, have been, um, uh, but I, and I wrote it two years, two and a half years ago. And I actually, I thought I was like, oh, it's gonna, it's gonna, we're fine with the dreamers and DACA, we're good. This is gonna be super irrelevant and wah wah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I wanna thank our actor so much. Um, Bobby, yeah. <laughs> So uh, both of them have done really extraordinary work. Bobby has a relationship with this project and that he's been in a reading before. Um, and Dahlia has just had a day of rehearsal, hours of rehearsal. Um, so to both of them, a huge uh, thank you. Um, so what is your, what have you in terms of uh, relationship to the project, what, where does it most resonate for you, um, either as an actor, as a person in the world? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I was told not to talk about this stuff just to get reaction. Oh, it's not on? I do this all the time. What is, how do you do it? Hello? Hey, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, uh, it's more of a question of like how this play doesn't resonate with me. I mean, I can see from out here, like a lot of, the, we know the immigrant tale, I think a lot. And I think when we did it in New York Theater Workshop, a major thing that I kept kind of coming up with was just, I just saw my dad constantly of the, like I, we had like a, I remember at one point we were talking about the character of B and how just his circumstances, just of what he was born into, nothing more, have slowly just put him up into a corner to where he has no choices, basically. I don't think that's a spoiler by any means, but like, I mean, that's just, if that's not an immigrant tale, I don't know what is to where everything is literally working against you. Um, and what's kind of beautiful that I think it's, it's the idea of 
another f a friend of yours that you have a sanctuary with, this whole sanctuary city, the sanctuary relationship, um, how that's tested with, um, with the ability to go to school or to live your dreams and how that affects your relationship and how that affects your perspective. And what's interesting to me is like, even within this close relationship uh, that they've known so much about each other, know everything about each other and their circumstances of being uh, undocumented and all that kind of stuff, once she gets documented and once she gets to school, he becomes even more by himself and she has her own experience as well. Like the, it, the you kind of lose the connection and like it just, I don't know, there's something about that switch that kind of really hits home with me because I find that's more of a tale that I see where <coughs> it just shifts. Like when my dad got uh, his immigrate, like his visa and his everything like that to where family members, that's not what, that wasn't the case. And like there was just like a, a disconnection as far as the experience of each other. And, and then what's inevitable is like they still fight for each other, which I think is also an immigrant tale. There's no soaking in the sorrow of the thing. Someone's trying to bring you up and keep you going forward, which I love about it. So yeah, it's, I, I connect with it in all the different ways of being part of an immigrant household, yeah. I wanted to add to that, um, I think that what really resonates with me from this play is that everyone's really, they're, the, the VNG, they're, they're working really hard to be here. Like they're, you know, he's, they, she wa they wanna study, they wanna, they're working really hard and I think that we've, we, you know, also being a part of an like, immigrant family, like it's, it's just this constant, like constant hustle um, and then through that like constant hustle, their relationship and then the safety they feel with each other. And, um, but I like that, I like that, you know, she's working, she's, you know, wa waitress saying or, and, and yeah, that really resonated with me. And to even to do that, even with the struggle of not having documentation or <laughs> like, um, yeah, that really, I felt that way. There is also another surprise in the play, which um, since this is being live streamed to HowlRound, we won't tell them. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not the only thing that we especially is dealing with right now that comes in later in the play. So yeah, just because it's being live streamed, I don't want to give it away. Yeah, yeah, they got to come and see the play. but it's this huge active note um, and talking about the world of the play. And I feel like that happens in this place, um, which we were marking for the cast and, and for the actors that it just goes after. So I wonder, um, you know, Martina, if you can just talk a little bit about uh, this linkage of memory and time and how that, um, if you're consciously playing with that or the role that that's playing um, for you. And you can talk either creatively or I think it's like uh, I didn't realize that I had that I was that I was doing that. I think, and then that, and then because of it wasn't the default sort of linear, we're in one place. At, you know, for a time, it it's it sort of stood out from it, people. People thought that they needed to remark on that to me. I was like, oh, I guess I am playing with time. And then why why would I be doing that? And and I um, I sat with the question for a little bit, and and I and I wondered if it had to do actually with being sort of bicultural and living and having lived in other places where there's, like I was born in Poland and my family's still back there. My mom is here and my and my half sister. And um, I, I always want, I didn't make the choice on my own to come here, I was brought here. Uh, and I wonder about this other version of myself that might still be there. And who is she? What is she like? Would she be a playwright? Um, and, and I 
I think that that's when you know that there's time is so um, there's time is bound with different selves of uh, different different versions of yourself and um, and and place and I th and I I like to juxtapose scenes where characters have plans and then later on we see what happens <laughs> because most of us make we make the best decision we can in the moment and then life will tell us whether it's going to work out or not you know uh, and um, and I like watch I like seeing the intentions of people and then seeing what might happen to them that might have been very much outside their control. So maybe it has to do with that too. Um, so folks who know Ironbound, then it travels 10 years, 20 years in advance, then back in time, uh, 22 years in all. Uh, and so you get this sense of uh, the dream or the vision and then what did or didn't happen, the rerouting. So it's, it's not just circular forward, but also the the movement back. Yeah, they're speaking to each other. There's a there's a relationship that a person is having while they're they're not just and and it's rarely that some that a character is passively observing. Their whole body is taken in with them through the whole experience. So when you mentioned a memory walks in, there's certain memories that assault you. There's you know there's there's ways that memories hit you, uh, and then you are just there. And I and I think um, uh, particularly for people that don't often sit and muse about the whys of things, you just sort of thrust into them. There's something that's similar with, the, with, with memory where all of a sudden you're just there um, and, and you're experiencing it again and then you're out of it or you're not, you know, that that's, that that's a, that you're living many lives, many, vers many lives during, during the day. Um, so can you, uh, we've alluded to, can you tell us just a little bit about your life trajectory? You were born in Poland. I don't know if you want to talk about sure. Chernobyl, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but just uh, it will give us a sense of. Yeah, I, um, I uh, was born in Poland and um, when I was two and a half, um, m my baby teeth turned black and disintegrated from what we think is Chernobyl radiation exposure. Um, there's really kind of no way to track it because that wasn't, it's a, a, a lot of the history of that is the history of um, uh, evacuation and refugees, uh, and um, so I don't know if it was Chernobyl, but definitely it happened that week. <laughs> um, uh, w woke up with ash in my mouth, and uh, and um, that event, and when the when the truth about that event came out, was largely something that made my mother want to leave leave um, that area. Uh, and, and in addition to other things, it wasn't also it was also personal as as much as as much as. Um, event that seems like a hist big historical event had to do with her wanting to leave, so did other personal things in her life. Um, and uh, we moved to, to New Jersey, you grew up in the area around, uh, in, in and around Newark, uh, at the end of the path train, if anyone's a Jersey person, no, no, okay. <laughs> you! <laughs> end of that path line, my friend, good pizza and Nino's. And um, we, my mom worked in factories and clean houses. Uh, I didn't see theater until I was about 18 years old. Um, and when I went to college, uh, also went to public schools. And when I went to college at the University of Chicago, that's the first time I got to sort of explore it. And um, afterwards, went to Yale School of Drama and Juilliard, all because it was free. Like I went to get health insurance. <laughs> um, they also and, and they also had stipends, which was why I was able to go. So it's sort of those were that's sort of how. That's a short version, I guess, of my journey. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to read you a little bit about the character you play. Um, I think there are ways that Martina does some thinking uh, that end up having a big impact potentially on the way theater gets made, um, productions get planned. So in the notes here, it says, the country's of origin for these characters complete the operative territory where no character is Western European in origin. Uh, the characters have grown up with the American cast and architecture in America have connections through and through teens about their countries of origin, um, but she doesn't specify which countries. Um, so one thing that leads to is a more intensive notion of countries um, across those different productions. Um, so she says, dear Jean or Penny, can be any of the new Catholic family of Ecuadorian, except I will play an Indian who is very much of a minimal Latin. Um, and the area where one of these characters grew up is multicultural, and the characters could be as well. Um, so when you're thinking about immigrant plays or kind of refugee plays, uh, then this insistent um, multicultural and pluralism also seems to be one of the things that Sanctuary City in particular is doing, but also in terms of, um, well, the way we make theater. Uh, so it's a great, it's a great gift. Um, how, how uh, there are plays where you're quite specific about where people are from. Uh, can you track 
which one which one's why yeah I, the, like for this one it was it was part like w growing up like in Newark and around it was like everyone was from somewhere somewhere else um, I used to s it used to be the thing where like when kids were learning how to walk their parents were learning how to speak English at the same time um, and so that was like my understanding of this country was understanding of America um, and it was not strange for like the Polish person to know some Spanish and things like that. You know, it's like right outside of New York City, and um, uh, and for this play in particular, I it felt like it didn't. It wasn't as much about where they're from as much as it is that they feel themselves to be American. They've grown up here, and um, and it's not as though there's something in another place that they really don't have a connection to that they don't want to return to. It's that they this is the home that they've lived in and understand. And this is where their friends are, and um, and this is where they plan to make their future. And so that's why it didn't. It felt like um, I would have been closing doors by specifying um, uh, exactly where everyone is from. So I wanted it to be to be more open. Uh, and then certain place, for example, cost of living, has I say there's two disabled characters in the play, and I say please cast disabled actors in these roles. Period. <laughs> like there's no qualifying. It's just period, and uh, and I did that specifically because I felt that for um, those ro those roles for disabled um, characters, the, the the disabled community of actors tends to get jumped over and ignored. So like, listen, love Brian Cranston, love Eddie Redmayne. It's very handsome, very good, talented, but like. You're jump most of the time you're jumping, people are jumping over peop other very talented people that are not given the opportunity to, to portray disabled characters. Um, and so, thanks man, thanks dude. <laughs> uh, and so it was just like, well if you wanna do the play, you know, it, that y you have to cast disabled actors. And I've, I've, I've like deaf's had theaters tell me, ah, we'd love to do it, but like we just don't know any, and so I like publish lists of where they can get them, and it's still like, ah, oh, we'd love to do it, but like our theater's not accessible, and I'm like, that's easy to deal, to help you with, also there's funds, do you want help? And then sometimes it's just because they, they like the play, which is fine, but like, don't use those excuses. Um, and and um, hopefully, the, like one of the coolest things with the, with the Pulitzer was, I, I feel like, I hope that maybe people now will not have as much of an excuse if you know, like, they, if you want to do the 2018 Pulitzer Prize play, you have to cast disabled people. <laughs> so, yeah, that's that was where they came from. Um, so, in terms of language, the, so there's two things that we said. Uh, working class, we talk a lot about immigration and refugee. All of your plays are deeply saturated in working class lives um, and access to politics. Um, and so. Uh, Siri will tell you all about it. Listen up. Working class, Siri. We have no money. Shit is hard. given that we're engaging working class lives, and then I want to ask about the reception of the works and what gets staged <laughs> and in what spaces, right? Um, yeah. uh, so Siri's response was perfect. I don't understand <laughs> that, um, what you're talking about. So, um, you know, what are the ways when a piece gets premiered at wherever, um, Manhattan Theater Club, you know, have you thought about, I know you have, <laughs> give us a window into um, how one diversifies audiences or your, uh, not writing to the subscriber-based position of privilege that many regional theater audiences would have. Yeah. I mean, it's, if I want to write anything that has to do with my life, it's not going to be an MTC subscriber. Is I guess like I was, you know, I, yeah, I'm not an MTC subscriber. I didn't wasn't born raised as like an MTC subscriber in terms of having disposable income to go to the theater. No judgment, on, no judgment on subscriber audiences. That just was not my experience. And so I wrote from my experience, and, and uh, when I first started writing plays, people would tell me, oh, you're writing about immigrants, oh, you're writing about poor people. I was like, yeah, I guess, but it's just my family. Like, it was my family, and then from the outside, I got the response of, oh, you're writing about this thing and this ism and that sort of thing, but it's like you cannot separate 
the realities of immigration law on these people's lives, for example. It's not just like an article and a nice like thing to add into a character. It's like it's dictating the parameters through, through, which, through which they have to move through their lives. Um, so, you know, I could, uh, I, I, f I hope that an audience would come meet me, you know, and, and uh, a particular, it's, I, man, I don't even know where to start, the like surprising responses I've, I've, I've gotten. Um, uh, I'll tell you a one that had to do with cost of living when we did cost of living and MTC2 talked about it. It's like, um, I kept getting the note during previews. There's a, I'm gonna spoil something, but it's fine in the play. There's a character who you don't realize until later on through the play that she's been sleeping in her car. She's uh, She went to Princeton, the character went to Princeton and uh, has graduated and has fallen on difficult times. Her mother has gotten sick and has had to go back to her home country and, um, and she's here alone um, and having to make ends meet and help her mother in an another country uh, and student loans, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and ends up having to sleep in her car is the best option. And I kept getting the note from um, audience members that they didn't believe that somebody who went to Princeton could end up sleeping in their car. And um, I was not this, I was not too, my, in my experiences of my life, I was, I was personally not that far from that fate, um, you know, not having a place to, to live. Um, but you never wanna be like, what, it really happened? And then shut the fuck up, but cause like that's not useful. Uh, <laughs> or it's, use, it's useful to like a point and then they're still like, I don't get your play, I'm not coming back. Uh, and so I kept, I, I, I was like, the play is not about this, it, that is not what the play is about, but if, but I, okay, I'm, you're telling me you don't understand something, okay, cool, I'll, I'll, I'll write a little bit more to help you, help you accept that, to, to, to take it in. And I kept writing this garbage, like just terrible monologues about poverty and I was like, oh, I just, I felt disgusting and I took it out because I was like, this isn't this character. I left some of it in to like do a compromise, and 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 I and like still I would still get the same notes. And and there was one day a group of um, students from Newark and Jersey City, so the area that I was writing about and from, came to the show, and I asked them in a talk back. I was like, so when the, she says like you know this, she went to Princeton, she's sleeping in her car. Did that was that weird for you? And they were like, no, <laughs> like. You know, they, they, were, they were like, yeah, it's my cousin or whatever. And, and, and I was like, all right, cool. Like, it's not that the play is wrong. It's not like that there's something. But, but um, um, I, I guess I'd, I'd hope that I, I'll, I'll go up to a point and then hopefully you'll meet me halfway. Um, I'm not trying to exclude anybody from these narratives. The idea is to invite people in. Um, but I can't convince somebody that, that like the, um, the, the truth of what the country they live in is. I think it ended up having to be about like people didn't want to believe that somebody who went to Princeton could end up sleeping in her car, and I was like, I can't help you. <laughs> so, so that's one. But it's but it's often it's like, oh, I I don't have I haven't had this experience, and so therefore it must be false, which I think is like a very, it's a dangerous position I think for anybody to say a human being is not capable of something, good or bad. Like we've had we've had the, the history of the world to tell us that people are capable. A human body is capable of horrible atrocities and beautiful, wonderful acts. And to say I don't believe that that's possible, I think, is a very limited perspective on your life and living. So I don't know what you do. It won't surprise you to know that I think almost every play has the sentence sentiment, there is no place for sentimentality in this world <laughs> or something to that effect. Um, do you guys have questions of each other before we open it up to the group? Questions? Yeah, like Martina or you of them or. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or out here. Where's a good place to get food in DC? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, in terms of moments when you were most hooked um, or questions you have, I'll say this also among the projects in process is a musical about Chernobyl, so that little snippet um, that we heard perhaps uh, there's going to be an audacious new play that one would not <laughs> imagine new coming musical. out. New musical. Chernobyl. Yeah. yeah. Um, I swear it'll be funny. <laughs> it has to be. Continue. These people continue. Like I think there's been a like, you know, people look at Chernobyl and they look at the quote-unquote like sad and devastating thing, which are they are sad and devastating things, 
But like you, people continue. They have to find a way to keep moving forward. And I think certain narratives get cut off at a point at which it's the most sensational and s and and um, devastating. But then don't look at how people continue. And so that's why they say it's funny. Not that Chernobyl is funny. It's totally not funny. <laughs> No, and there's also a, a mini series on right now, right? And so, like, thinking about what theater does differently or why you express the work you express through plays and theater. And I, I, haven't, I haven't seen it, but, like, you know, I wish, I wish Craig and, and the folks well. But, yeah, I think we're looking at different things. He's looking at the event, and I'm looking at the event plus what happens after. I have a question for the actors. Um, we were speaking earlier about this beautifully, liberatingly unique, um, <laughs> uniquely liberating choice to have the characters in this show listed as just non-Western European descendants, which feels very rare to me. And we're hearing a lot um, this, these few days from a lot of leadership, and I would love to hear from you, you as actors um, the the struggles and the hopes that you have as being actors who are non-white Western descendants here, um, what what that is like from the actor's perspective of like, am I making myself clear? Can you go somewhere with that? Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna call out someone who's already in the audience. Uh, Heather Rafa one time yeah. talked about um, value. And it stuck with me, obviously, for a while. This was like when we were doing a reading for at the Atlantic for like the Mixed Fest, Middle Eastern Mixed Fest, right? It's wonderful works of Middle Eastern people, uh, Middle Eastern stories, varying different stories, obviously. And one time in, uh, she was talking about the idea of v value as far as the people and crisis and constantly <coughs> being in crisis. Like that's a, it's a very big Middle Eastern thing, right? If you're in the Middle East, you're in crisis. That's, that's a common story we've told, right? Which is not not true, obviously. There is a good amount of crisis in the Middle East, correct? But I think the sheer thought of people just having agency and just kind of being like an everyday thing and having that ability and that strength and like seeing what that is in the world, like the sheer idea that I'm, I'm Iranian American, right? Having that be a thing but not be a thing does that make sense? Uh, I really feel like that's the step. That's the step I look forward to. And I feel like I've been fortunate to a degree uh, in theater to kind of have that ability to kind of stretch and not be defined by my ethnicity, which I'm not uh, ashamed of by any means or anything like that. But I just think there's so much more to a human than just their country of origin. I, I mean, I'm American. I was born in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Like, come on, I'm not like strictly, thank you. Um, <laughs> Iranian, you know, so there's so much more experience that I have that I don't get to express. Um, and it's getting better, I will say. It's not quite there yet. It's not there yet. But it is getting better in my eyes. And we have wonderful voices like Heather Raffo, like Martina, like a lot of different plays that are opening up to this be, um, to have agency, to have value. Like this story, like, yeah, it's crisis, but it's also just, it's more than that. It's not just that. It's so many different things. <laughs> It's like a love story, but it's more than a love story. It's, it's, a, it's an immigration problem, but it's more than an immigration problem. It's a human problem. It's like all the universal kind of tidbits. And like that idea of value and being more than just your crises and your place of origin, that's the, that's the goal. And I guess, sorry, to, not to really, but to answer your question, I feel like it's getting better because of playwrights like this and like there and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, um, I used to always say um, when I first moved here from Cairo um, that I was like, oh, I just want to work on projects that just have to do with, you know, oh, it's, you know, the relationship between the characters and it's like not like, oh my God, you are defined because you are Middle Eastern because I come from a mixed background. So my, my mom's Venezuelan, my dad's Egyptian, so I'm mixed. So it would always be like, no, you have to, you are this person and you're gonna play, you're gonna be in this play because you are this ethnicity. And so when I read this part where it was like, 
oh, it could be from any of these places. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly. Um, I think it is getting better because there are so many plays that are, it doesn't, yeah, the identity is important and the, the fact that you're an immigrant, it's, imp it's a part of the storytelling, but it doesn't really, there are so many different immigrants and there's so many different, um, like, it's not just like one color. So yeah, I think it's getting better. Um, yeah, I think it's getting better too. I think, is that, was that, did that answer your question? Were you <coughs> better or worse by getting better? Can I add one more thing? Yeah. Sorry, one more thing. It's also, and I'm not calling people out, but it's also the idea of these plays exist, we need to produce them. Right. Like, don't tell me they don't exist. I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard stories about, oh, we would love to do that play, but we can't find the people. Very common tale. Um, they're out there. I'm sorry. We've made literally databases for people. You literally just go to the website and click. A fucking database for every, like, yeah. you need a thing, here's a thing, here's a thing, here's a database. That's right. There's a database somewhere for your thing that you need. That's one thing. Right. <laughs> like, we have the technology, we have the people. That's a big thing. We have the people. So don't. Just try. It's not a hard try. I don't think. You'll be surprised. Just try. And like, I'm sure people will help if it does get difficult. That's all. Yeah. 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 Oh, also, just now clearly we have like a lot of opinions about this. May I add critics while we're at it? Like there's also. That's exactly what I was uh -huh. thinking too. Yeah. You. Well, do you want to ask it? Do you want to? No, no, no. Okay. Well, it's just that there's like, um, I swear to God that if Death of a Salesman had been written by a woman, they would have called it like emotionally baggy and domestic and small. <laughs> like, it's a good play, but like there's a perspective that a person has on it of like, oh, this must be small and, and you know, whatever, because it's written by a woman or by an XYZ or whatever, whatever. And, I th and, and like, it would be like nice to have, a, to have sometimes like, Yes, the, the, the identities of these characters is bound within who they are, but also it'd be nice to sometimes just be have the freedom to be able to write a character. Oh my God, when I write white dudes, I feel so free. <laughs> I feel so free, because I know it's not gonna be like I'm making a comment on, or speaking for, you know, it's like, uh, I'll write a play and they'll be like, well, these female issues or well, these, I'm like, yes, 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 but can I just, can she just be like complicated or like, as opposed to it being a, a comment on like women or any, any other, any other thing that has to be. And I think that that's, that's, uh, um, that's also in how the work is talked about um, after it's, uh, you know, w once it's up. The thing that always kills me is like theater is beautiful and ephemeral and then it goes away and the only thing that stays are the reviews online, <laughs> <laughs> which is, very a very biased perspective. We all have a bias. We all have a limited experience of living our lives and the things that we've consumed. But if there's only one person out there who can say whether yes or no, and and this is, and, and and whether it's valid, then that's dangerous as fuck. May I go backwards and answer why do I stay with it? Why do I, I, I hate writing so much. I really don't like it. But I love being in the rehearsal room with actors and, and collaborating. If I think if I knew, if I had the right answer, I'd write fiction in a room by myself, but I know I don't. I write, when I write plays, they're a, hy they're a hypothesis. The first draft is a hypothesis, like is this true, does this work? And then in conversations with other people and their truths, you work to make a, a, a more honest version of whatever story that there are. I, I hope I try to, I hope to, and I love that process so much. I, I feel more alive in the rehearsal room than pretty much anywhere else in the world. Um, so I continue doing it for that. I also find the, um, when I first started writing, I found it really, um, uh, I had to be everybody, I had to be all the characters, and so nobody could be a villain and nobody could be a victim because you had to occupy all of them. Uh, and uh, and that I find that to be a beautiful thing and and very useful and helpful. Um, I don't. Uh, there's conversations I can have with myself through the act of making theater that I don't think I'd be able to have on my own or just in you know in in, in, a, in a in in a way. And so that's kind of why I keep keep doing it. I love it. I'm addicted. 
I can't stop. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> that's why I keep doing it. So the immediate question that I had when I when I was uh, listening to the reading was, why wasn't this, why ha why has why didn't this get written before? And then I understand that it was just sort of a spur of the moment idea that you had. Um, so then my my new question is, would you have been able to write something like this, let's say even five or or ten years ago? where the conversation about undocumented immigrants or migration in general was a lot uh, was a lot different back then. I mean, at least I can say that five years ago, I would be fighting with very progressive liberal friends about, you know, they were saying, yeah, if you're undocumented, you should be sent back just because you're undocumented. And even 10 years back, I mean, it was even more uh, harsh. So would you have been able to write something like this 10 years ago, five years ago? Fuck yes. <laughs> then can I ask yeah. why 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 yeah. didn't you? Um, because I had other plays that also dealt with the topics. Like I started writing, I'd say like um, what 2005 or so, and they were all they were all. I was undocumented for a time. I overstayed my visa. My mom overstayed her visa, mm -hmm. um, and and I and it's in the plays. It's in the other plays too because it's their it's their lives. My first play that. When I was a play called Iron Brown, that's about a Polish immigrant that's largely based in my mother's experience, and that's, and um, and so I was writing those things. They were, they existed. Mm -hmm. Why is the first? Why is this the first time you're hearing about it? I don't know. Why do you think? <laughs> no, no, I had had a. Why maybe before. it's because it's not on Broadway? Why is not on Broadway? Well, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but yes, I, w I want I, like, but I think I, I think I know what you're asking me. Like, yeah. was it like would it? I, it, this wasn't a thing of like, oh, I read an article and I like, I read, I wrote this like, this particular one before the, bef I actually thought genuinely like, oh, the, the, th the issue of dreamers has, has, you know, we've, we've, we've figured that out, we've solved it, the Dream Act in 2012, it's all good. And then, then this has been, this has been happening in DACA and all these things. And so it wasn't the, the purpose for me, actually the purpose for, for this play wasn't like, oh, let me show the lives of, um, of uh, these of of the situation, it was me feeling intense guilt for mm -hmm. a choice that I made, um, where I could have helped more and I didn't, and I and mm -hmm. and and I started writing it from there. So mm -hmm. only come from personal places that have the political in them, but I but I and I think these plays have existed and they've probably existed. At, the ones who've kept produced existed on small stages mm -hmm. that are now changing, but aren't at the height that they could be. So I think yeah, they think they could have they could have been uh, particularly if the person is writing from personal experience. Yeah. Because that's not it's not po what's popular in the news. It's just your personal experience. <laughs> yeah. If anyone would like, we have time for one more question. Is this on? Hey, I promise my question isn't that good. Hi. <laughs> Wait, yeah. Hey. Oh shit! Hey. Hey, how you doing? How you doing? Good. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Hey. Yeah. Hey, look right up there. Yeah, you too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Martina, I feel like my question is probably um, the flip side of Hector's, which is that I think I have seen um, on stages, small at least, and in, in uh, different. Uh, incubator groups that nurture writers of color, this tendency to lean into a uh, trope uh, that actually is sort of like hemmed in by the, the stories that producers want to see uh, told. And so actually like, especially for uh, undocumented writers, Latinx writers specifically, just narratives of uh, uh, migrant issues and border crossings are really, really prevalent. And I'm wondering how we um, challenge institutions to highlight stories that are incredibly timely and personal uh, and urgent while not leaning into the trap of sort of like liberal back padding that happens where they only want to see us as one thing. They only want to see Middle Eastern stories as stories involving terrorism. They only want to see uh, black stories that involve black death, for example. So 
How would you uh, break out of those tropes while still staying true to the stories you want to tell? I mean, I, I institutionally, I wouldn't know like what's in, in terms of like what what they could do aside from like finding what, finding language and and I mean, it, it's also it's like it's money, right? Like, I mean, you're having to it's like nonprofit theater, yes, but it's capitalist. You got to pay, and you got to pay a bunch of money to go, and and um, it's and it's not like um, it's it's in the it's in the marketing of the thing that you might. There, there are many ways to have pleasure in the theater. They can, you can be scared. You can have, you could be laughing. You could be crying. And it's not. I think most of us aren't like trying to get our news from the theater. We're trying to. We're chasing after those like feelings of transcendence and that that we that we want. And they could also happen to be, you know, about uh, uh, about many things. But like to your question about tropes, I feel like, like I I um I I actually get a like um I have a lot of like. Um, White playwrights will ask me like, "Can I do this?" And I was like, "Why are you asking me?" Like, like, "Can I? Can I? Whatever." There's this one one person uh, was uh, she was trying to write a write a one person show um, where she talked about the, her, her neighborhood, and she's like, but "There's a there's a character in it that's that has a, that has a, a thick Asian dialect, Asian, Asian accent." Like, can can she? She was asking, "Can she as like a white performer do that?" And I was like, "Okay, well, listen." I was like, "You can do anything." However. Like know that whatever story you're telling is in conversation with all the stories that have been told I ever, and including all of the representations of any one identity that have been told or allowed to be told on a certain platform ever. And so like if you choose to do that, if you as a white person choose to occupy that position, you will be in conversation with the Mickey Rooney's and the other, all these things and whatever. So like do you want to be a part of that or do you not want to be a part of that? And I leave the choice to you. Uh, and and uh, so I think there's, when you're when one person is writing, I think they have to be conscious wherever they're from, of uh, of the the tropes that are told about any one particular person, and then you know ask uh, ask themselves, is that this character? Have you made that choice because you feel like they're from this identity? Like, um, uh, what what are you putting out? In the, a play is limited time; it's ninety minutes, so you can't encompass an entire person's life, but if the things that you're choosing to tell about any one character that happens to be this, which also was seen as a very specific thing, um, that might be a dangerous, that might be a dangerous thing that you're doing and unnecessary, and so so find, find the other thing to show. But, uh, th and there also, I feel like there are, there are these plays that are, that are, um, that are, because, because the writers are from these particular worlds, they're writing you know, from their experience of being a millennial living in New York City or whatever it is, that also happens to be, um, you know, undocumented or black or whatever, whatever other thing. And uh, and then the reviewers or the people from the outside are saying that it's a play about this, when that wasn't the intention. It's not, uh, that wasn't the sole intention to, to, to write. If you were a play about like four girls hanging out, and uh, if, if you like trying made girls all black, would it then be a show about the black experience? Yes, but not just. Like, no one's saying, oh, the white girls is a play about the white experience. It is, <laughs> but no one's calling it that. And so this defaulting that I think is happening is why we, we're having to, you know, playwrights who, have, who are othered and stories who are othered continue to be othered because, because we've, we've lived with the default for so long and no one's called out the default. So I mean, it's a kind of a long-winded thing of, but I'm not sure, how do we solve it, fix it? What should we do? <laughs> I don't know. Fix it, Brian. <laughs> One of the things that you do is the both and. Um, mm. So, I mean, cost of living, the title has it right in there. It's so much about economics and it's so much about um, the human costs uh, of living. Yeah. And some, like the both end with the flexibility with language. In almost every play, there's some marker. So in cost of living, where it's saying, you know, wherever the character is from, uh, you know, translated into that language. You've got the flexibility here. So it's both particularized and um, open. I can't tell you the number of times people have been like, oh, cost of living is about disability. I'm no, like, it's exactly. not, it's, it's not, not. I mean, it is, it is, but not, but not, absolutely not. It's but that's like what I'm saying, both are. and. Yeah. And that's, yeah. uh, you, you, you're creating these stories that are resisting, but that doesn't mean that the reception is the going lens, to. <laughs> the lens hasn't quite changed. Yeah. So the outside lens of how those, of how, to, how to define those things hasn't, and so you're, then the person watching it is then going in with a certain thing of like, ah, oh, I'm supposed to learn about the disabled experience, which is false. It's just, it's false, a false way to enter a play. So it's, ra it's I feel like it's more um, 
to focus on the things that make we're way more we're may, we're way more similar than we are dissimilar. We've all experienced love and loss and grief and all of these things, and they all exist in in, in you know in in these plays that that are, are binding. But the, this like focus on the the difference is like yes, it's true, but it's also not just that thing. He was just saying that's always an interesting starting point. Um. Uh, the idea of starting a play of the thought of where we meet each other as opposed to where we don't meet each other, like that's, that's a really interesting thing to me. And that's what I feel like when we talk about problem plays or topic plays or things, I feel like when we just focus on the topic, we find the difference and the other and the push away as opposed to a more empathetic inviting thing which I think theater is kind of based on in the sense of communitas and everything of where do we meet each other and even in the most terrible person we're going to meet them somewhere in some kind of human experience like I always feel like that's a more interesting inviting point with the play than the other which you do find the other time sometimes yeah thank you thank you so much. thanks for having us uh, <laughs>Just a huge thank you, Bobby and Dahlia and Martina and Maya. Really beautiful performance and conversation. Um, so we have about a 10 minute uh, pause here before we resume with um, Secretary Madeleine Albright, Ambassador Palouse, our friends from um, Alliance for New Music Theater in conversation and performance with Václav Havel's protest. So there's coffee in the lobby if you want to stretch your legs and we're back.